Hello students, welcome to the lecture on demand forecasting and after the lecture we will be able to learn the following objectives. Understand the purpose of forecasting demand, explain the steps involved in forecasting, define extrapolation techniques of demand forecasting, explain time series and seasonal indices, understand the method of simple average, explain moving average method. Let's start with a brief introduction to the demand forecasting. It is challenging to forecast demand for a product introduction because we do not have any historical data. Demand for a typical product introduction starts slowly and accelerates as promotion kicks in and the product becomes more widely known. The difficulty is to predict how rapid this process is going to take place. Forecasting provides an estimate of future demand and the basis for planning and sound businesses' decisions. Since all organizations deal with an unknown future, some error between a forecast and actual demand is to be expected. Thus, the goal of a good forecasting technique is to minimize the deviation between actual demand and forecast. Forecasting product demand is crucial to any supplier, manufacturer or retailer. Forecast of future demand will determine the quantities that should be purchased, produced and shipped. Demand forecasts are necessary since the basic operations process moving from the supplier's raw materials to finished goods in the customer's hands takes time. Heard of an occupation that rewards an employee for being wrong? Surprisingly, you can, as a demand forecaster, be wrong and still remain in the company's good graces. Why are errors in this occupation tolerated when they would likely lead to dismissal in other job roles? The answer lies in the fact that all organizations have a need to understand and quantify future customer demands for its products and services. This knowledge will facilitate decisions that can significantly increase the competitiveness and profitability of the organization. For example, an organization projecting 25% annual growth will need to invest in manufacturing capacity upgrades and additions in the future, Failure to do so on a timely basis would likely result in lost sales, expediting costs, and low employee morale. Forecasts are often wrong. Luckily, the decisions required to operate a successful enterprise rarely require 100% accuracy. As long as the demand forecast is reasonably accurate, the organization can still make the correct decision. Continuing with the previous illustration, if forecasted growth was 25%, while actual annual growth was 28%, the company will still need to expand in the future. While the timing of their capacity expansion may be slightly incorrect, the plan to add capacity is still valid. In other words, the forecast was value-adding. This course will provide you with quantitative demand forecasting techniques that are appropriate for a large number of the mature products sold today. In addition, forecast performance measures will be discussed that evaluate the degree to which a demand forecast is value-adding. Let's know about the purpose of forecasting demand. Demand forecasting is essential for a firm because it must plan its output to meet the forecasted demand according to the quantities demanded and the time at which these are demanded. The forecasting demand helps a firm to arrange for the supplies of the necessary inputs without any wastage of materials and time and also helps a firm to diversify its output to stabilize its income over time. Now we will talk about the purpose of the short time forecasting. It is difficult to define short run for a firm because its duration may differ according to the nature of the commodity. Short term forecasting can be undertaken by a firm for the following purpose. Appropriate scheduling of production to avoid problems of overproduction and underproduction, proper management of inventories, evolving suitable price strategy to maintain consistent sales, formulating a suitable sales strategy in accordance with the changing pattern of demand and the extent of competition among the firms, forecasting financial requirements for the short period, the purpose of long term forecasting. The concept of demand forecasting is more relevant in the long run than the short run. It is comparatively easy to forecast the immediate future than to forecast the distant future. Fluctuations of larger magnitude may take place in the distant future. The purposes are as follows, planning for a new project, expansion and modernization of an existing unit, diversification and technological upgrading, accessing long-term financial needs 
it takes time to raise financial resources. Arranging suitable manpower, it can help a firm to arrange for specialized labor force and personnel. Evolving a suitable strategy for changing pattern of consumption. Here we will discuss about the steps involved in forecasting. There are usually five basic steps in any forecasting task. Step 1. Defining the problem carefully requires an understanding of how the forecast will be used, who requires the forecast and how the forecasting function fits within the organization requiring the forecast. Step 2. Gathering information. There are always at least two kinds of information required, statistical data and the accumulated expertise of the people who collect the data and use the forecast. Step 3. Preliminary or exploratory analysis. Always start by graphing the data. Are there consistent patterns? Is there a significant trend? Is seasonality important? Step 4 is choosing and fitting models. Which models to use depends on the availability of historical data, the strength of relationships between the forecast variable and any explanatory variables and the way the forecasts are to be used. Step 5 is using and evaluating. A forecasting model once a model has been selected and its parameters estimated, the model is to be used to make forecasts. Now we will talk about extrapolation techniques of demand forecasting. There are numerous techniques of demand forecasting that can be used to control inventory. These are as follows, time series analysis. This is based on the assumption that the item being forecasted follows a similar pattern over time. The basic elements of these patterns are constant value, trend, seasonal variations, cyclical variations, random variations and turning points. Qualitative. Qualitative forecasting consists of gathering opinions from a variety of people and applying their own judgment. Casual. This is the application of leading indicators to create a forecast. It assumes demand is strongly related to these indicators. Simulation. Simulation forecasting combines the casual and the time series methods. It is often used when creating what-if scenarios. Here we will understand the time series and seasonal indices. Economic time series data can be broken down into following components. Secular trend, the long-term trends of C, employment, stock prices and other business and economic series follow various patterns. Some move steadily upward, others decline and still others stay the same over. Cyclical variation. The second component of a time series is cyclical variation. A typical business cycle consists of a period of prosperity followed by periods of recession, depression and then recovery with no fixed duration of the cycle. Seasonal variation. The third component of a time series is the seasonal component. Many sales, production and other series fluctuate with the seasons. The unit of time reported is either quarterly or monthly. Irregular variation. Many analysts prefer to subdivide the irregular variation into episodic and residual such variations. Episodic fluctuations are unpredictable, but they can be identified. Episodic variations. The episodic variation identified with random occurring events. Residual variations. Small random fluctuations that are unpredictable and associated with neither specific events nor cyclical variations. Moving averages are part of what we call time series analysis. If we think about data collected at regular intervals, this is often called time series data. And it's a method of forecasting. We look at trends and patterns in the data. We remove variations from the data. And this helps us predict future behavior. It also helps us smooth our data out, as we will see in some charts later on in the video. The two most basic types of time series analysis are simple moving averages, which I'm going to cover in this video, and weighted moving averages, which I will cover in a separate video available from my channel, Learn with Dr. Eugene O'Loughlin. So, what is a simple moving average? Well, at its most basic, it's an estimate of the demand for a future time period. And we get this estimate by averaging the demand for a number, usually between 3 and 7, of the most recent time periods. So let's take a look at a simple example which will explain what we mean by this. Supposing we've got some sales figures for 3 months, actual sales figures for January, February and March. And we want to be able to use these actual figures to help us forecast the figure for April. So what I've done here is I've taken my January, February and March figures and I'm going to put them into a formula to help me calculate my moving average. So you can see in the formula down here at the bottom that I have my 
forecasted figure for April is equal to, and notice that I put them backwards this time, um, the figure for March plus the figure for February plus the figure for January. And because I'm calculating a three-month moving average, I want to divide the actual figures for March, February and January by three. So I've taken that formula and just put it up at the top here. And now I'm going to make this look a little bit more scientific. So at the top I have my forecast for April is equal to the actual figures for March, February and January divided by three, representing the three months. And down at the bottom, bottom I have replaced April with F. So my forecast demand, remember April is the month I'm trying to forecast my demand for. So that's the current month. So that means FT, T meaning the current month. And that's equal to the figures for March, February, and January, and I'm representing these by the letters A. So March is T minus 1, so April minus 1 is equal to March. So I add the actual figure for March, A T minus 1, to A T minus 2, which is the actual demand for T minus 2, which is February, plus A, the actual demand for T minus 3, which is January. And then I divide that figure by 3, and that will give me the forecast demand for um, the current time t April in our example here. Now let's look at an example and here's an extract from Excel and just examine these figures first. You can see that I've got some sales figures for all the 12 months of the year 2011 uh, starting with a figure of 8,938 for January and working my way down to 11,055 for December. And there's two main things I want to do here. I want to calculate my moving average for all the months, or as many months as I can throughout these figures, and I also want to be able to calculate the figure for January. So to do all of that, I'm going to use my actual demand figures here. These are the existing figures, so these are my A figures. And I also want to calculate my forecast figures, these are my F figure, for the month of January. So here's how I do this. Now, because I'm calculating a three-month moving average, I, of course, can't do this for January, February, or March. So the first month in my year is April that I can calculate my three-month moving average figure for. So I want to calculate this for April and all the months down to December and into January of the following year. So here's how we do this. First off, uh, just like in the earlier formulas I had here, I'm in Excel, I can, you can see here in cell D5 that I've got on uh, C4 plus C3 plus C2 divided by 3. So just look, watch out for the brackets in this because uh, division will take precedence over plus. So I'm adding my three monthly figures for March, February and January in that order and then dividing the sum of that by 3 me a result of 8,421. So my moving average for the first three months of the year is 8,421. And in Excel then I simply copy that formula down to the end of my column here. And I've got all my values uh, for each of the months. Now these are moving averages for each of the months based on the actual demand. And then down for January is the forecasted demand. I don't have an actual figure for January because I'm predicting that figure. And I can see here, using my moving averages, the figure highlighted in yellow and pointed out in red here, the figure of 10,424, and that's based on the moving average for the previous December, November, and October. One last thing to do with this data here, I've got two charts here. And the first one is just a line graph based on my original sales figures before I calculated any moving averages. And you can see that there's quite a bit of variation in my data here. The line is going up and down. And if you remember from our introduction, we want to use time series analysis to remove variation. My second chart on the bottom right hand corner over here is a chart illustrating my three month moving average figures. And you can see straight off that there are no figures for January, February and March because we were not able to calculate those. And the most striking thing between the two graphs is that the graph on the right-hand side, bottom right, is much smoother than the one on my left-hand side. So I have removed variation or reduced variation, and I can see uh, that for most of the year the trend is upwards and that the trend is downwards towards the end of the year. And this may give me some valuable information when I'm forecasting future growth, not just for January, but all the way for next year. Let's talk about measuring linear secular trends. If the secular trend is linear, there are two methods that are commonly used to measure the secular trend linear regression analysis and moving average. Linear regression analysis. It fits the time series data to a straight line equation shown on the screen. 
where yt equals the value of the time series yt at the time t. A equals to the intercept, the value of yt when t equals 0, the base from which time is measured, b equals the regression co coefficient. The method of least squares regression is normally used to determine the values of the intercept A and the regression coefficient B. There are three basic steps in a linear regression. First, we look at the scatter plot. Second, we perform the regression analysis, which generates estimates of population parameters. Third, we interpret that analysis. Why do we start by looking at the scatter plot? First, because there may be a relationship between our variables, but the relationship may be nonlinear. Here's an example of a nonlinear relationship. If we would look at the scatter plot, we would see that. It would save us the time of going straight to a linear regression, and we could instead use other nonlinear techniques. Second, a, a quick look at the scatter plot may just tell us there really is no relationship, as in this data that I randomly generated. Doesn't look like a relationship, so I'm not going to try a linear regression. Now, on the other hand, here's actual data that I pulled. On the y-axis, hedge fund returns from the HFRI hedge fund index regressed against, or in this case, just plotted against, returns from the Russell 3000, a good proxy for the overall market. And a quick look at the scatter plot, at least to me, says this looks like a linear relationship and therefore worthy of a linear regression. And so the linear regression, in this case, draws a line through the data, and that line represents the best fit. There's a purple line here because this plays a role as well, and this is just the average of the y values. But the red line is the regression, and it's expressed by the linear regression formula here given by y equals alpha plus beta multiplied by x plus epsilon in this case, which is the error term. So the error term plays an important role. So that's the linear regression. It's a best fit line. How did that line get generated? Well, by typically by ordinary least squared methods. And so if we take one of these observations, like this observation right here, and look at the distance from that observation to the regression line, if we take that distance and square it, and then do the same for this next observation and for each of these observations, and so we can call that the distance the error between the actual observation and the y as predicted by the linear regression, we can square those and sum those, that gets us a big number. This line attempts to minimize that number. Ordinary least squared attempts to minimize the sum of the squared differences between the actual observation and the, uh, and the predicted y on the line. So this is the linear regression formula pretty simple. I show it here three ways because sometimes we see it with different notation and we don't want to be thrown by the notation. These all mean the same thing. In, in some cases the intercept may be Roman A or Greek Alpha or even B sub zero. But in all cases, if I just take this first one here, we have Y, the dependent variable, is a function of or equal to the intercept that's the y-intercept. Where does that line hit the y-intercept? Plus the slope, that's b or sometimes beta, multiplied by x, the independent var variable. So we can say y is dependent, x is independent, y is a function of x, or the way I like to think about it, y depends on x. And finally, don't forget the error term. The error term reminds us that this line it will never be a perfect fit. There is error or dispersion between the actual observations and the line. Realistic data will never fit on the line tightly. So error captures that dispersion and reminds us that this is just a prediction of y. This formula, intercept plus slope, multiplied by x, is just a prediction of y the actual y is going to be some error off of that. 
So to summarize, x is the independent, y is the dependent, and the error term is the residual that reminds us x. Moving average. If the secular trend is approximately linear and the variations around the trend are approximately periodic, the cyclical, seasonal and irregular variations around the trend can be mostly eliminated by using a centered moving average of the time series data. Log linear regression models. Not all regression models are linear. Log linear and power function models are often encountered when working with economic and financial data. However, these functions can be transformed into linear forms by using logarithms. Log linear transformation. Log linear functions are commonly used in time series analysis where a variable grows at some constant average growth rate over time. For example, suppose sales are $1,000 in 1900 and they are growing at a rate of 5% per year. Now we will know about measuring non-linear secular trends. The secular trends of the most economic and financial time series are not linear, rather they are exponential trends that grow at an average annual growth rate. Two approaches could be used to estimate the secular growth rate of the data. First, use the conventional compound interest formulation. Look at the formula shown on the screen. Instead, when projecting secular trends, the second method is to use a log linear regression model. The formula is written on the screen. Here we will discuss about seasonal indexes. In order to construct seasonal indexes for the data, compute a centered one-year, four-quarter moving average of the data. Average successive centered moving averages so that the result corresponds to the same period as the quarterly raw data. Compute the ratio of each data point in the time series for which a moving average exists to its corresponding average moving average value. These ratios are called specific seasonal indexes, deseasonalizing data. Once a set of seasonal indexes have been constructed for a time series, unseasonal Z data can be personalized by dividing the raw data by the seasonal index. Let's know about the method of simple average. The method of simple average is faulted on account of the fact that all past periods are given some importance, whereas it is justifiable to accord higher importance to recent past periods. Ratio analysis. Ratio analysis means making forecasts based on the ratio between some casual factor, the number of employee required. Sometimes it's not enough to simply say a company is in good or bad health. To make it easier to compare a company's health with other companies, we have to put numbers on this health so that we can compare these numbers with the numbers of other companies. So now, how do we use numbers to assess company health? This is where financial ratios come in. Very common types of financial ratios are liquidity ratios, profitability ratios, and leverage ratios. Liquidity ratios can tell us how easily a company can pay its debts so that the company doesn't get eaten up by banks or other creditors. An example of this is the current ratio. This tells us how much of your company's stuff can be easily changed into cash within the next 12 months so that it can pay debts which need to be paid also within 12 months. The higher your current ratio is, the less risky a situation your company is in. Now moving on. Profitability ratios can tell us how good a company is at making money. An example of this is the profit margin ratio. This tells us how much profit your company earns compared to your company's sales. Normally, a higher number is better because you want to earn more profit for every $1 of sales that you get. And finally, what about leverage ratios? These can tell us how much debt the company is using to make the company run and stay alive. An example of this is the simple debt ratio. This tells us how much percentage of a company's assets are paid for by debt. Normally, a company is considered safer when the debt ratio is low. Note that this was just a very simple overview. There are a lot more financial ratios and many different ways of using them. 
plus a lot of problems and disadvantages in using them as well. Trend method. Under this method, the time series on the under forecast are used to fit a trend line or curve either graphically or through statistical method of least squares. The trend line is worked out by fitting a trend equation to time series data with the aid of an estimation method. The trend equation could take either a linear or any kind of non-linear form. The trend method outlined above often yields a dependable forecast. The advantage in this method is that it does not require the formal knowledge of economic theory and the market. It only needs the time series data. The only limitation in this method it assumes that the past is repeated in the future. Now we will discuss about moving average method. This method is used to represent a demand process of type which is shown on the screen. That is the demand is represented as a level with random noise. Parameter A is not really known and is subjected to random changes from time to time. Using the simple moving average procedure, we can get an estimate for A and it can get updated as time progresses. Estimating procedure. The procedure involves the determination of average of demand of last n periods. As new period demand observation is available, the old period demand data is removed from average calculation. Number of periods considered for average calculation is the same, but demand data considered for the calculation is different at different time periods. The method of link relatives. In relative link method of seasonal variations, link relatives are calculated for all the values of the data. Link relatives equal to the value of a year or the value of the previous quarter. When we calculate the sum of link relatives for each quarter or month, the average of these totals is calculated by dividing the totals by the total number of years in a quarter or a month. Chain indices are calculated from these averages. Now in the end, let us summarize what we have learnt in this lecture. Demand forecasting is essential for a firm because it must plan its output to meet the forecasted demand according to the quantities demanded and the time at which these are demanded. Qualitative forecasting consists of gathering opinions from a variety of people and applying their own judgment. Log linear and power function models are often encountered when working with economic and financial data. The method of simple average is faulted on account of the fact that all past periods are given the same importance, whereas it is justifiable to accord higher importance to recent past periods. The trend line is worked out by fitting a trend equation to time series data with the aid of an estimation method.